Poodle skirts, slicked back hair, hula hoops, sprawling suburbs, television, and a phenomenon called rock and roll. At Sock Hops, kids were doing the bop. A decade of Elvis, a rebel without a cause, and a day the music died where we saw the end of one Asian war and the quiet beginning of another, and a Supreme Court decision that opened schoolhouse doors to racial equality, the I Like Ike decade, the age of conformity, the 1950s. As the Cold War unfolded in the decade and a half following World War II, the United States experienced a robust economic boom staking its claim as the most prosperous nation on earth. The gross national product continued to make giant leaps forward as more and more Americans considered themselves members of the middle class. There were several reasons behind the boom. One of them was cheap gas, which allowed the automobile industry to flourish. In fact, the number of cars produced in the U.S. quadrupled between 1946 and 1955. After 1945, major corporations in America tended to grow even larger. Mergers were common, as were reliable smaller franchises such as fast food restaurants. Some major conglomerates even developed holdings overseas where labor costs were often lower. A housing expansion took place as well, partly due to inexpensive mortgages offered to soldiers returning home. Developer William J. Levitt invented the suburb, and American families began moving away from inner cities and into these communities, seeking nice homes at affordable prices. This is sometimes known as white flight, with more and more white families moving to the burbs. Stores followed, leaving downtown shopping in the dust. Large shopping centers changed consumer habits of average Americans, the number of these centers jumped from eight in 1946 to almost 4,000 by 1960. New highways accompanied the birth of sprawl as well. And a Supreme Court decision called Brown versus the Topeka, Kansas Board of Education struck down the legality of separate but equal education facilities and programs. The Brown decision paved the way for future desegregation of public facilities that would come in the 1960s. Finally, television contributed to the prosperity of post-war America. By 1960, three quarters of all American families owned at least one set. Popular shows at the time were Howdy Doody, I Love Lucy, Father Knows Best, The Honeymooners, The Mickey Mouse Club, and of course, Mr. Tuesday Night, Milton Burrow. But the 1950s weren't just about Uncle Milty's Tuesday night skits. There was a dark side. The political and social phenomenon known as McCarthyism encompassed much more than the antics of a single senator. By the time he joined the anti-communist crusade early in 1950, the movement named after Senator Joe McCarthy had been going strong for years. Senator McCarthy built a short but powerfully influential career by falsely accusing political opponents of alleged association with communism. These intentionally public accusations served to fan the flame of public suspicion and fear that communists were secretly plotting to overthrow the American government and ultimately the American way of life. We will not knowingly employ a communist or a member of any party or group which advocates the overthrow of the government of the United States by force or by any illegal or unconstitutional methods. We request Congress to enact legislation to assist American industry to rid itself of subversive, disloyal elements. Nothing subversive or un-American has appeared on the screen nor can any number of Hollywood investigations obscure the patriotic services of 30,000 loyal Americans in Hollywood who have rendered their government invaluable service in war and in peace. Prominent liberal opponents, the press, the entertainment industry, the State Department, and even the United States Army were among those targeted. 
McCarthy and politicians like future President Richard Nixon hope to further their careers and elect a Republican government. High-profile anti-communists like FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover worked hard to eliminate this perceived threat from America. The true nature of the Cold War was shaky at best, but 1950s politicians often portrayed it as the end of the world. This was the essence of McCarthyism. Following on the heels of McCarthyism, a much more enjoyable phenomenon was emerging. Kids were dancing to Bill Haley and the comments, grooving to Buddy Holly, and crowding in front of their TVs on Sunday night while a boy from Tupelo, Mississippi, Elvis Presley, swiveled his hips just out of camera range on The Ed Sullivan Show. A Cleveland, Ohio disc jockey named Alan Freed named it rock and roll. Young America learns safety on the road. Licenses are checked for 250 hand-picked teenagers at the start of a 106-mile economy run in Northern California. The youngsters are given a carefully measured quantity of gasoline, which they must use sparingly during the test. To conserve the precious gas, schoolmates push them to the starting line. The battle began with a bomb, the HH bomb, HH for higher hemlines. Dior dropped it. Christian Dior, one of France's leading exponents of haute couture, which means high style. Only Dior thought it should be higher, and brother, that did it. 18 inches from the floor for the new hemline, as against the current style of 13 inches. Well, sir, Dior now insists he was misquoted. A new wardrobe may be rough on us guys who pay the bills, but then a gal with gams makes any battle seem well worth the fight. The space race was an informal competition between the United States and the Soviet Union, which lasted roughly from 1957 to 1975. It involved the parallel efforts by each of those countries to explore outer space with artificial satellites, to launch humans into space, and to land people on the moon. Though its roots lie in early rocket technology and in the international tensions following World War II, the space race effectively began after the Soviet launch of Sputnik 1 on October 4, 1957. Space race and arms race technology went hand in hand and became an important part of the cultural and technological rivalry between the USSR and the United States during the Cold War. Space technology became a particularly important arena in this conflict, both because of its military applications and the psychological component of raising morale. Rockets were important because the same rockets that launched satellites could deliver nuclear warheads. The space race, which started in the 50s, would reach its zenith in 1969 when the United States achieved President John F. Kennedy's vision of landing an astronaut on the moon and bringing him home safely. Suburbs, television, McCarthyism, Brown versus Board of Education, rock and roll, and the space race, the 1950s set the stage for the turbulent decade to come. The 1960s would change America like no other decade before. For Snapshot, I'm Craig Marbury. She's rock to the east, she's rock to the west, but she's the gal that